Hello, everyone. My name is John Lustria. I'm with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I'm the education coordinator there. And it's, uh, it's a thrill to be with you all uh, this Friday. It's nice to, to have you all joining us. Let's see here. Uh, yes, hello uh, again, everyone. My name is John Lustria. I'm the education coordinator here at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. It's wonderful for, uh, to have you all with us today. Uh, I'm gonna wait just a couple minutes before getting started, give you uh, everyone a chance to, to get on the stream, uh, to, to log on and all that, uh, share the stream. Uh, we got our, uh, uh, my pal Jake Wynn in the comments here. Uh, he'll be kind of posting some content throughout the, uh, the program. Uh, hello, Wendy, nice to, nice to see you here. Uh, see in the comments, uh, everyone uh, comment where you're watching from. It's always fun to see, um, you know, people from around the country and around the world uh, tuning into these. So um, that's been quite uh, fun. We got Barbara from New Jersey. Excellent. Um, anyone else out there wearing a bow tie? It's uh, I, I uh, decided it had been entirely too long since I'd worn one of those, uh, any sort of tie. So I thought I'd go for some uh, tie day Friday action. Um, with, the, with the bow tie today. Uh, like I said, we'll get started in just a couple minutes, uh, give you all a chance to, to share the video, tell your friends, other people to, uh, to get on the stream and all that sort of thing. And uh, we'll get started shortly. We've got Rebecca from Annapolis, Gary from Ellicott City, Maryland, uh, Sharita from Florida, all very exciting. It's a thrill uh, to have you all with us today. And, and part of what's been so wonderful uh, about these is seeing uh, kind of some familiar names keep popping up uh, in the comments there. That's been uh, just delightful. Um, I, I know it has been for me and, and I'm certain it has been for, for my colleagues as well. Uh, Tim, uh, Glenville, New York, no bow tie, but a flannel shirt, that counts. Uh, we got Betty from Tampa, uh, Sarah from Towson, Maryland, uh, Bonnie from Al Albuquerque, Excellent. Getting people from all over the place. Ah, well, um, since it is National Nurses Week and we're, we've never been more grateful for nurses than we have been over the last two, three months here. Um, and, and, you know, of course, us uh, at the museum, we always do something um, for, for National Nurses Week. And this was a, a presentation I was originally supposed to give in person at the museum uh, tomorrow. Um, but now today I'm, I'm giving it to you all over Facebook Live. So the show is going on uh, and that's, that's always, um, you know, that's nice. Um, I see we have Lori from Alexandria, Virginia. We got Patricia from Bicklerville, PA. Got your membership card in the mail, that's excellent. Um, let's see, yep, to new info during Nurses Week. Uh, Vicki from Massachusetts is tuning in, excellent. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, as, uh, as Rita mentioned, uh, this is indeed uh, Nurses Week. Uh, I, I wanna say yesterday was the actual Nurses Day, um, or maybe it's just an all week long celebration, not sure. Um, I probably ought to know that. But anyway, um, part of uh, how we're, uh, we're celebrating and paying homage to, um, uh, to nurses this week is uh, to kind of hone in a little bit more specifically on one nurse that uh, doesn't get talked about as much, um, and that is Clara Jones. Um, and I'll, I'll get to her in just a moment. Uh, let's see, we have some other people tuning in. David from Pittsburgh, um, Betty from Tampa is a retired nurse, excellent. Um, Robert from Naperville, Illinois. Uh, Lynn from Cantonsville, Maryland, David from Newark, uh, New York, excellent. Um, May 6th in the US uh, is National Nurses Day and May 12th internationally. Thank you, Rita, appreciate that uh, for, for correcting me on that. Um, so where was I? Oh yes, yeah. so uh, you all who've been tuning in regularly, I'm sure you're, uh, you're perhaps tired of hearing this and you know what's coming next, but. First of all, thank you so much for those of you that have become members. If you're watching and you've enjoyed these videos and you haven't yet become a member, um, today might be a great day to do that. 
Um, it, it really, really goes a long way towards helping videos like this happen. Um, we're incredibly appreciative of that. And if you can't, uh, if you don't feel like uh, you can become a member, uh, our lowest level is only uh, $25. Um, but if you, if you feel like you can't become a member, even just a, a five or $10 donation goes a long way um, to, to helping us out. Uh, and if you can't even do that, um, simply sharing the video around on Facebook, you know, telling your friends about it, you know, getting more views for the, the videos, th that's a big help as well. Liking and sharing the video um, is something that all of you can do uh, uh, watching the video. Um, so uh, we'd be really grateful if you, if you did that. And most of all, we're grateful that you're here. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about um, one of my favorite subjects related to Civil War medicine. It was one of the very first projects I started working on when I started working at the museum uh, almost exactly three years ago. Um, time flies um, when you're having fun. Um, Clara Jones, uh, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, um, a, a family member, a descendant, uh, donated a, a collection of her letters to the museum in 2003, and they contain just all kinds of really incredible information, um, not only, of course, about her Civil War experiences, but about medical care, um, you know, in Civil War hospitals. Um, so it, it's a, they're a really valuable resource to the field. And one of the, the first projects that I started to do Someone else had already transcribed them by the time I started at the museum, but uh, to my knowledge, no one had really kind of dove into the letters and and kind of seen what there was to see in there and, and kind of pull out details and and all that stuff. And uh, let me tell you, Clara Jones is just a delight to read. Uh, she's so so quotable. Um, there there are just so many great turns of phrase that she uses. She has a great sense of humor uh, and it made kind of putting together a little presentation uh, very easy, very easy. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm excited to get to share this with you. Uh, I know, uh, you know, some people have read blog posts that I've written about her. Um, some of you may have even seen uh, me give this presentation before. I've uh, given it once or twice in a couple different places, uh, but never at the museum in Frederick. So I'm hoping this will be new for um, for a number of you, uh, but I, I just think it's it's such a cool resource. And you know, anytime anyone spends a little bit of time with a historical figure like that, you know, reading their mail, basically, um, you know, you 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 develop this uh, uh, you know fondness for them. And I know I certainly have for uh, for Clara Jones. So the story that you all are going to hear today is uh, it, it's out there now, but it's uh, not one that a lot of people. Have uh, have read or listened to. So you're some of you are joining a small but elite group <laughs> today. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this was going to be a presentation that I was originally scheduled to give um, tomorrow in the museum physically. But of course, that's that's uh, uh, not happening now. Um, so anyway, I'm excited to be able to bring this to you all. Uh, some of you who just could not have been there. Um, so. That, that part of it is exciting. And um, to add to the multimedia experience here, uh, I have a PowerPoint, which I'm gonna pull up here. I'm gonna do a screen share on my computer. Let me see here. Hopefully this goes smoothly. It worked, uh, uh, okay, there we go. Okay. And you're gonna, gonna see behind the curtain, you're gonna see a, a, a video of myself as this. Okay, pulls up, fantastic. There we go. Pull up the PowerPoint here. And we'll get started shortly. Okay. There we go. So while I have uh, my PowerPoint up, I won't be able to, to read the comments. So if you have a question at any point, go ahead and drop it in the comments. Uh, and when I get to the end, I'll go back through and I'll, I'll read through all the comments and, and get to the questions. So if you think of a question, type it while you're thinking about it so you don't, uh, so you don't forget. Um, so uh, without further ado, here we go. Um, and actually just a quick word about this picture. So this is a picture of Clara Jones. Um, 
circa 1860, you know, around the time of the Civil War. Uh, and it was actually really fortunate that I even came across this. Um, this is, uh, if you can believe it, from a newspaper feature in, uh, oh shoot, uh, in, in the 20th century, 1903 or something, 1903 or 1913, I'm blanking on the exact date. Um, but it's it's was published in the 1900s um, in in the San Francisco Call. Um, that's the name of the newspaper of, of all places. Um, there was a, a two-page spread about Civil War nurses, and there was just you know short little biographical sketches on you know several of them. Um, and Claire Jones happened to be one of them, and there happened to be a wartime picture of her that was included in the uh, in the story. So it's actually very serendipitous that. We even have this. Uh, and I found that on the Library of Congress's um, uh, library, online library or online newspaper database, which is just an absolutely incredible resource. Um, it's fun just to kind of poke around on um, if you have a historical subject you want to research, uh, either, you know, in the 1800s. Um, they, I'm not sure how much they have in the 1700s, but obviously they have quite a bit in the 1900s. Um, and I, I guess I would assume it goes up to, you know, pretty close to the present. But anyway, there, it's just a wealth of information. I just started typing in, you know, Clara Jones, nurse, Clara Jones, Civil War, and, you know, all kinds of keywords. And, and I eventually kind of stumbled across uh, this, this story here. So anyway, um, I, I love that this picture exists. So uh, I'm gonna quote from her a lot uh, in the presentation um, because A, she's a great quote, um, and B, uh, I think using as much of her words as possible really gives you kind of a, a flavor uh, of hers. So she wrote in September of 1861 that, if I know I can be of service in tending the wounded, I'm bound to be on hand. And even though she wrote that early, in the Civil War, uh, it proved to be a, a pretty accurate forecast for her wartime experiences. Clara Jones was always on the scene if she knew she could be of assistance. Um, a few kind of biographical details about Clara Jones. Uh, her father, Thomas Jones, was from Wales, uh, and her mother, Lydia, uh, was from New Jersey. Um, Clara was born on November 28th, 1832. Um, shout out to all you November uh, birthdays out there, myself included. Um, she had two older sisters, Elizabeth and Theodosia, and a younger brother named Thomas. And at the time of the Civil War in 1861, Clara Jones was 28 years old and unmarried. Uh, itself, uh, not uncommon, but um, not, not the, the norm of the day. If anything can be said of her, it's that Clara Jones absolutely hated inaction. Uh, she frequently remarked in her diary and letters of her desire to help in any way possible, whenever possible. Much to her dismay, her ability to give aid to soldiers during the Civil War was hindered by her job at Rittenhouse Grammar School in Germantown, Pennsylvania. That's just outside Philadelphia. Uh, and as a single woman, uh, Claire Jones had to work to earn a living. She wasn't uh, independently wealthy, so she had to you know, do work. Uh, and her desperate desire was to kind of help people kind of on the front lines, but uh, her job kind of kept her, as she thought of it anyway, stuck at home. Uh, like most people, Jones knew someone who was serving in the army. Uh, for Jones, it was a friend of hers named Lane Schofield, L-A-N-E, Lane Schofield of the First Pennsylvania Reserves. And it was to Lane that she wrote most of her letters. Uh, and that's the, the vast majority of the letters in the collection at the museum are addressed to Lane Schofield. Uh, Jones felt guilty being at home, doing nothing while the soldiers were enduring hardship at the front. Quote, if I was in the middle if I was in the midst of the distress consequent upon a battle, lending a helping hand to the poor fellows, I would feel really happy in comparison. But here I am tied to school, hearing all sorts of rumors, having questions, the most perplexing propounded. 
Dear me, had I been born a man, uh, I should have escaped it all, lamented Jones to a friend. You've no idea how irritated I become on this war question. I never attempt to argue, for I think that anyone that does not hold to our government is wanting in that commodity called common sense. But when I hear persons make assertions which are untrue, I take the liberty of correcting them. And you know how famed I am for my mild persuasions. Um, she was very opinionated and a very staunch unionist. Uh, she essentially wouldn't hear anything else uh, if someone espoused support for the Confederacy. Um, let's see, so as a 28 year old single woman living in the Northern suburbs of Philadelphia, uh, she was only able to attend to men at the front during school holidays. If she could not go to the soldiers as often as she wanted, she resolved to help in any way she could. Initially, her efforts towards soldier relief started small and mirrored those of many women um, across the home front. She wrote, appeals are constantly being made by the government to the ladies to furnish socks, blankets, comfortables, etc. I'm going to knit some more socks and mitts, she wrote to Lane. If there is anyone near you who seems destitute of friends and to whom such articles would be acceptable, let me know and I will forward a pair of each as soon as I get them done. So she's always thinking about people she even doesn't know uh, who, who are in uh, Lane's regiment. And I should note uh, actually about her relationship with Lane. That's one of the biggest mysteries I have about Clara Jones. Um, they're obviously very close. Um, as far as I can tell, they're not related, uh, but they sort of address each other as brother and sister. Uh, at times, their language in their letters when they're kind of talking to each other, um, it kind of hints that maybe there could be a romantic relationship there, um, but they ultimately go on to marry different people. Uh, and Lane uh, names his firstborn child after Clara. So there's there's something there. I don't know exactly the nature of their relationship, whether they, you know, tried it and it didn't work out, or maybe they never dated at all. Um, it's just a great mystery. I, I just don't quite know enough of the details uh, about their relationship. But in any case, they're very close. And that's why we have um, so many letters, thankfully. Um, as the war progressed, uh, wounded and sick soldiers gradually made their way to northern hospitals to recover from wounds and diseases con uh, contracted at the front. Not long after newly created military hospitals had admitted patients in Philadelphia in the fall of 1861, Jones arrived on the scene. After hearing of, quote, the miserable manner in which local hospitals were being managed, she marched off to the Christian Street Hospital to offer her services. Jones was told she should go home and wait for another doctor's approval and summons to help out. Never one to wait for anything though, Jones chose to sit outside the aforementioned doctor's office only to be told when he arrived that she was not needed. Unsatisfied with her reception, Jones then spoke with the doctor's uncle, whom she knew personally, uh, and finally she was allowed to help out to her heart's content. The plight of the wounded soldiers distressed Jones, leading to a relentless pursuit to provide assistance. To think of those we love dying without a friendly hand to minister to their necessities, tossing about in pain, and none to hold the cup of water to the parched lips was almost unbearable to her since I could easier weep for the woes of others than my own. Uh, and that statement was certainly a motivating uh, inspiration for Jones as it was for a host of Civil War medical professionals and medical professionals today. Uh, I could easier weep for the woes of others than my own. Uh, it's certainly, at least for me, a, a very inspiring statement and one that I think we should all take to heart. While she volunteered at the Christian Street Hospital in Philadelphia, Jones was flabbergasted to find that most of the volunteer nurses were wealthy, quote, first ladies of the city who occasionally gave an hour of their time here or there. Uh, Jones asked indignantly, what good can they do walking around in their silks? What sympathy can they feel for suffering humanity who have never suffered themselves? While eager uh, to help while eager to help ease the suffering of those in Philadelphia, she jumped at the chance to go to the front during the winter school break of 1861-62. 
she traveled to several army encampments in and around Washington, D.C. and Alexandria, Virginia. There, Jones and her coworker that she brought with her, a Miss Marie, uh, visited, cared, and cooked for the sick in various regimental hospitals. Jones wrote in her diary, I always thought, and I'm now entirely convinced, that one woman can do more good in a regiment, in a regimental hospital, than an army of cardinals. Uh, one instance of the trip is particularly illustrative of Joan's unrelenting attitude um, that she often applied to her work as a hospital volunteer. A part of the occasion for visiting the camps outside the Union Capitol was to meet up with friend and pen pal Lane Schofield of the 1st Pennsylvania Reserves. Uh, she repeatedly asked for directions to his unit's encampment, which sent her searching the region surrounding Washington. A group of three Union soldiers eventually gave her the correct path to Lane's camp, but not before commenting that it was, quote, inaccessible to a lady on account of a series of rocks, a series of rocks, gullies, and water. Quote, indeed, madam, you could not get over, the soldiers remarked to her. Difficult terrain could not stop Clara Jones, and she wrote in her diary, fully determined that I would get over, and she underlined the word would, uh, fully determined I would get over, I asked him for directions, telling him I was resolved to try it, feeling certain I could surmount any difficulties. The route ended up proving as challenging as advertised, but she eventually did find her way to Lane's camp. The trip to Washington and its neighboring army camps invigorated Jones. Uh, she wrote of her time, I cannot forbear mentioning in this place how very happy I felt at the reception given us both by doctor and patients. The latter looked as pleased to see us as though we were sister or mother to them. I do not think that on any former occasion I paid a visit that repaid me for inconveniences in such a degree. Truly, I was repaid a hundredfold. Um, so I, I got a question in, in advance about, um, you know, whether Clara Jones, as she went on these escapades, if she felt like she was living the dream, as it were, you know, finding her true calling. And, and quotes like this, um, I think absolutely suggest um, that she was. Uh, she's clearly loving what she's doing. After returning home to Pennsylvania from her first visit, she frequently wrote to Lane asking how she could assist the regiment while on the home front. What can I get for the doctor? Does he stand in need of anything? There is nothing in the world that I would send more willingly than my unworthy self. I am tired to death of this life of quietness or rather inactivity. I never wished for summer so earnestly as I do now. Joan's time in Philadelphia and Washington was just her introduction to nursing. As the school year drew, drew to a close in the summer of 1862 uh, in Philadelphia, Clara Jones had settled into a comfortable routine. She wrote to Lane that I go visit at the hospitals and then run errands and come home. I wish I could take up my abode permanently in one of those institutions. I think I would be quite contented. Soon, she would make her wish a reality. School closed for Clara Jones on July 9th of 1862. And by August, Jones had started full-time work, full-time hospital work on board a boat, the state of Maine. Uh, that's the name of the ship. Uh, and there you can see a picture of it. Uh, the state of Maine was one of many Northern vessels equipped to treat and transport wounded soldiers from the front to more permanent hospitals behind the lines. Uh, over the month of August in 1862, the state of Maine transported more than 3,000 sick soldiers and exchanged prisoners of war between the Virginia Peninsula near Fort Monroe and Point Lookout, Maryland. Though preferring to care for, wound, for Union soldiers, Jones' first trip uh, aboard the ship carried about 1,000 Confederate prisoners from Fort Monroe uh, to near Richmond. There they would be exchanged for uh, another thousand Union soldiers from the infamous Libby prison in the Confederate capital. As Jones remembered, each of the Union soldiers, quote, had some words of gratitude. Thank you, madam. God bless you, miss. Oh, that I were able to remain among the suffering always. I have shed more tears since they came aboard and yet felt happier than I've been in months. Her relief efforts on the ship typically involved offering soldiers comforting food and drink. 
She wrote, the supply of wine and jelly contributed by my dear girls was found very acceptable, as were the pickles, which I myself distributed among them. I saw men sit down and cry like children to find themselves once more to the protection of our flag and receiving the comfort that they had so longed for. Um, so uh, after being in a Civil War prison, or at least certainly uh, away from home for quite some time, uh, a little bit of wine, jelly, and pickles would go a long way, I would have to imagine. By early September, the state of Maine was commandeered by the United States Quartermaster Department and went out of service as a hospital ship. With school still out of session until the 1st of October, Jones vowed to remain active for the full month. Um, she visited Dorothea Dix, the superintendent of Army nurses in Washington, to request an assignment. Dix told Jones that there was no use for her due to Jones' limited availability, saying she could basically only help out for a month. Not one to take no for an answer, Jones met with another contact she had at the Surgeon General's office. There she had a little bit more luck, and then uh, Jones went to the Lyceum Building, large public lecture hall converted into a hospital in Alexandria, Virginia. And there is uh, a picture of it, and it still stands today. You can still visit the Lyceum um, when indeed we can go visit things. Um, well worth a visit. They have a nice little museum there that I, I would absolutely recommend. While at the Lyceum, Jones encountered her most challenging work as a nurse to date. She recorded in her diary that she found 60 badly wounded men without a nurse, without comforts of any kind. The smell arising from the undressed wounds was perfectly dreadful. I've been hard at work making beds and washing faces ever since my arrival this evening, and I think the men will rest more comfortably. Within a day, Jones observed that her presence and care made the men, quote, more cheerful than last night. Jones was hardly volunteering for the glamour or the notoriety. Her room at the Lyceum was tiny. She recorded that she could touch two opposite walls at once from her bed. Uh, she did have offers from several local residents to stay in their homes, but Jones, quote, declined their kind offers because she wished to be near the patients and because she was independent. Her words, not mine, um, which I find fascinating that uh, she described herself that way. Uh, she oversaw 11 attendants during her time uh, at the Lyceum, six white and five black. Jones was critical of the five black attendants, saying that, quote, they are never here and they seem to disappear just when they are needed uh, and they are more trouble than all the sick combined. Uh, while her attitudes uh, of her time or were rather ahead of her time regarding female equality, uh, the same might not be able to be said for her thoughts on racial equality. Now, summing up uh, any one historical actor's total viewpoint on something as complex as, as you know, racism and, and racial equality is hard to do just from, from one quote. It is uh, one piece of circumstantial evidence um, that doesn't point in Clara Jones' favor. Again, hard to know what to make out of uh, one quote, but I think it's at the very least noteworthy uh, and, and worth mentioning there. Uh, and, and the ways that historical actors can be frustrating. Sometimes you can love them one minute and, uh, and be very frustrated with them the next. Beyond changing dressings and attending to the cleanliness of the hospital, Jones wrote letters daily for the men, particularly those who she knew were in critical condition. Death became a common feature of life uh, for her while working at the Lyceum. Jones reported seeing between one and three soldiers' funerals per day. Uh, and during the majority of her time working at the Lyceum, she cared for wounded soldiers from the Battle of Second Bull Run, um, which was fought not terribly far away um, from Alexandria. As Jones was making preparations to leave Alexandria in early October, having an obtained an extra month's leave from school, she came down with typhoid fever. She wrote, the doctor assured me that I could not possibly escape having one of three diseases, typhoid, jaundice, or boils. An epidemic of typhoid fever had broken out among the patients at the Lyceum about two weeks earlier. And after a week of bed rest in her small room, Jones felt well enough to travel home to Philadelphia by October 19th. By November 1st, she had largely recovered and resumed teaching again at Rittenhouse Grammar School. 
And you just have to know that that week of bed rest while in a hospital herself um, just had to eat away at her knowing that um, you know, she wasn't able to help other people. You know, they say that doctors and uh, nurses make the worst patients, and I'm certain that was true uh, with Clara Jones. Having caught typhoid fever, she spent several months fully recovering, complaining often of the prescribed doses of quinine. Um, the trying experience would not stop Jones from feeling eager for school to be out of session so she could be free of her teaching duties and resume her nursing efforts. In fact, she was so determined to return to the front that she proclaimed she would do it, quote, even if the plague threatened. One of her former patients, quote, wrote me such a kind letter that I want to go and improve upon what I have done. It did not take long for that to happen. A month and a half after leaving, Jones made a joyous return to the Lyceum in Alexandria to cook a Thanksgiving meal uh, for 60, uh, somewhere between 60 and 100 men and you just know she was in her element there. Over the winter recess from school, Jones brought more food and medical supplies to convalescents in Alexandria and the Army of the Potomac where it camped at Belle Plain near Falmouth, Virginia. When winter break ended, Jones went back to the daily routine of teaching and occasionally volunteering at hospitals in Philadelphia when she had time. The end of school in the summer of 1863 coincided with the Battle of Gettysburg, the largest of the Civil War and the closest battle to Clara Jones yet. And of course, you know where she was going to be. Um, she arrived in Gettysburg by train from Baltimore on July 19th and reported to the Second Corps Field Hospital. They had about 500 patients, 100 of whom were Confederate soldiers. She wrote in her diary that I left a dying rebel soldier very sorrowfully far from home and friends with no prospect of sending a message to a heartbroken wife or mother. Their most bitter enemy would not refuse the tear of pity. Though as it turned out, several did refuse the wounded and dying Confederate soldiers tears of pity. After being seen by a surgeon, the Confederate soldiers did not receive attention from most of the field hospitals volunteer nursing staff who were not required to treat all patients equally. So Jones often offered to tend to the Confederate wounded. It was all Jones could do sometimes just to get a pillow for them to rest their heads on since some hospital aides occasionally refused outright to give any comfort to Confederate soldiers. Institutionalized international humanitarian law, which introduced strict provisions to treat all wounded non-combatants regardless of their allegiance, uh, had not yet been established. So the system at times uh, relied on human kindness and at times um, didn't quite uh, come all the way through. Jones wrote, we lose 12 men a night and the doctor says we shall lose half of them within two weeks. There's scarcely a tent that has not a dying man. I'm busy in the evenings writing for them. The suffering among them is beyond description. Some are wounded in such a manner as to make amputation impossible and the poor fellows die without help. Our men seem to stand it better than the rebels. I see a great deal of both. Perhaps I pay more attention to the latter than any other, other lady in camp because I see them neglected by the rest. As bad as conditions seemed, Jones was quick to credit the doctors for their good work, refuting the modern stigma that Civil War medicine did little good. She reported that I give all our surgeons credit for much care, although the mortality was great, would have been far greater had they been less attentive. When Jones needed a break, she would occasionally explore the surrounding area that had been the battlefield. She wrote of uh, one of her tours of the battlefield that the atmosphere in the neighborhood of the cemetery and indeed for miles around was most offensive. The fields were dotted with the half consumed carcasses of horses and the roadside was strewn with them half decayed with our men not yet having had time to burn them. An aspect of Joan's service often remarked upon by her patients at Gettysburg was her singing voice. She sang both individually with soldiers and in the hospital wide prayer meetings. When she saw some of her former char charges at another hospital, uh, the first thing they said to her was that no one sings for us here. I have felt a strange happiness in performing my duties here, Jones concluded about her service at Gettysburg. 
Every exertion I have made for the comfort of the poor men has brought its own reward, and I have been repaid a hundredfold for what little discomfort I have suffered. By August 6, two and a half weeks after Jones had arrived, the last patient was removed from the Second Corps Field Hospital near Gettysburg to more permanent general hospitals in larger cities. Since school was still out, Jones and two of her friends went back to Baltimore to resupply and set off for Rappahannock Station where the Army of the Potomac was located to distribute food and more medical supplies. Getting permission to join the Army proved to be more challenging than anticipated. As Jones remembered, it took three determined women nearly nine hours petitioning, requesting, insisting as the case required till the pass to the Army located at Rappahannock was gained. It was nearly night when the victory is won. Their arrival at Rappahannock Station made them some of the only women to visit the army during its post Gettysburg campaign. This prompted a remark from the commanding general George Meade that quote, ladies, if you've got here, you'll get anywhere. And who knows if that, if he actually said that, but I'd certainly like to believe that he did. Might be apocryphal, but it's a great line nonetheless. If you've got here, you'll get anywhere. By the end of 1863, Clara Jones had established an impressive nursing resume uh, and she was not done yet. As before, she continued her mission of mercy during the winter recess at the end of 1863. This time, Jones traveled to the camps of the Army of the Potomac near Brandy Station, Virginia, to pass out food and medicine to the soldiers. Leaving her home near Philadelphia uh, the day before Christmas Eve, Jones reached Brandy Station with, quote, barrels and boxes containing Christmas cheer and clothing for the Germantown boys and a miscellaneous collection of goods for the sick. She wrote that the news that Miss Jones had come spread rapidly and the boys flocked out of their huts to welcome me. The train containing her supplies, though, was uh, the bulk of her supplies was delayed, preventing her from passing them out personally. Uh, but she went home confident that the soldiers did fully appreciate that kind thought of friends at home. Not long after a trip to Brandy Station, Jones described how nursing had changed her overall disposition for the better, essentially changing her life. She wrote to Lane that, quote, a light has dawned on me this past year. Regrettably for her though, the nursing excursions that gave her so much life were about to come to an end. Caring for her sick sister, Elizabeth, was about to become her full-time responsibility, which she alluded to in her last wartime letter in the museum's collection. She wrote to Lane that Elizabeth is very much worse. She has been very sick, so I remained at home, feeling that it would be worse than heathenish to leave her alone. So I remained at home, uh, right. The same compassion that drove her to care for ailing soldiers would not let her leave her dangerously sick sister's side. Elizabeth would eventually pass away in 1864, leaving three children behind who Jones would care for. After Elizabeth's death in 1864, our understanding of Clara Jones shifts from being described in her own words to those of others. The museum's collection of her letters ends in 1864 with a couple exceptions, uh, but her later actions in the early 1900s um, thankfully appear in a, a handful of newspapers. And with that, I'll shift to a picture of, of post-war Clara Jones in 1903, um, also from that same um, spread that I mentioned where I got the wartime photo of Clara Jones. That's the, the, top, uh, the top one. Uh, and then the, the bottom one, um, those are all Civil War nurses um, on an excursion in Salt Lake City of all places. Uh, and Clara Jones is the circled one there. Um, one event that we do know that happened to Clara Jones after the Civil War was her marriage to John H. Dye, D-Y-E, in 1872. Uh, he was a widower who served as a lieutenant in the 33rd Pennsylvania. Uh, he was, uh, we, and I, we don't know too much about John Dye. Uh, he was a, a cartographer, a map maker um, by trade, and he spent some time doing that in the Civil War in addition to frontline duty. And John Dye brought four children of his own to the marriage. So despite never giving birth, uh, that I know of anyway, Clara Jones ended up caring for seven children uh, in her time. Newspapers uh, trace 
Joan's storied history of humanitarian aid into the 20th century. So just with the end of the Civil War didn't mean that Clara Jones stopped helping people out. Um, it really was something of a lifelong calling. Um, she was a member of the Women's Permanent Emergency Association of Germantown. Uh, in response to the Johnstown flood of 1889, a group of women from that association sent 55 cases of bedding and clothing to the stricken city. They all agreed that the disaster relief agency should continue to exist. During the Spanish-American War, Clara Jones, acting with the American Red Cross, helped send supplies to American soldiers in Cuba. And she even briefly corresponded with another notable Clara of the Civil War, Clara Barton. Uh, and that was a fun day in the office when we discovered that uh, crossing of paths. Um, and, and in that letter, they were working together to ensure that Red, Red Cross supplies would make it to Cuba on time. Jones was also an active post-war advocate for softening the minimum requirements of the Army Nurses Pension Act of 1892. Um, the Army Nurses Pension Act allowed nurses who served at least six months to draw a monthly pension of $12. Uh, almost 2,500 women of the roughly 22,000 that officially served ended up applying for a nursing pension. Uh, Jones joined the National Association of Army Nurses of the Civil War, uh, which is quite a mouthful, um, and served as its president from 1906 to 1909. Um, and that's the group that you see pictured in the photo uh, below there. Uh, during that period, she used the organization's political clout to lead an ultimately unsuccessful charge to amend the pension, the Army Nurses Pension Act to make it easier for volunteer nurses like herself to win pensions for their service. Jones waited until 1907 to apply for her own pension. Unfortunately for Jones, she met a common challenge for volunteer nurses, and that was proving her service claims. In lieu of official hospital records, Jones obtained corroborating evidence from the surgeons, patients, or other individuals she worked with. A substantial challenge giving the brief stints and varied places that she served. So Jones' task in particular was more difficult than most because uh, she bounced around so much. The connections she utilized included such luminaries as Alexander Henry, mayor of Philadelphia during the Civil War, and George H. Stewart, chairman of the United States Christian Commission, among many others. These prominent endorsements, though, failed to win the pension office to her side, and as far as we know, she did not receive a U.S. government pension. Pension Bureau claimed she had only three months of service rather than re the required six, in a letter to the Pension Bureau, she wrote that she did not agree with the several reasons given for the verdict against me. In 1916, Jones wrote the Pension Bureau, um, I think intentionally on Association of Army Nurses of the Civil War Stationery, that, quote, I have no income and sorely need what I believe to be due to my service for the government. There is no record that Jones ever received her pension. In spite of all of her frustration with the Pension Bureau, Jones still longed to do what she could um, when suffering came along. In 1917, there was a great headline that ran, too old to go to trenches. At age 85, Clara Jones just could not muster the strength to nurse, sol nurse soldiers in World War I, but boy, did she want to. And she certainly understood the desire uh, of women to go help like few really could. As with the Civil War, it was hard for Jones to think about conditions soldiers had to endure on the front lines and the struggles they would face when they returned from war. By the end of the interview, quote, the tears were streaming down her cheeks. Clarissa Fellows Jones Die succumbed to kidney failure four years later on May 3rd, 1921 at the age of 89. Certainly, Clara Jones is an incredibly remarkable story, but what larger meaning can we draw from it? Well, firstly, her experience shows us just how pervasive the war was. Whenever Jones wasn't working, she was volunteering her time to help the war effort. Uh, and Jones, like everyone, knew someone that fought in the ranks. It was ever present on her mind. Almost all of her wartime letters, even those not written to Lane Schofield on the front lines, contain some mention uh, the, of the fact that the war is going on. While the war was going on, 
there was no normal life. Despite the fact that 22,000 female nurses served, female nurses only get a 200 word paragraph in the whole six volume medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. That large number means that nursing and medical care was the primary way that women engaged directly with military life. Women spies and female soldiers perhaps had a greater impact on the outcome of the war per capita, but their experience was overall less common. Um, and so even telling a sliver of that story, um, as with the story of Clara Jones, is uh, important. And uh, my final picture of uh, Clara Jones here, she is the one, I believe, on the left uh, there. And this is at uh, the 1913 Gettysburg reunion. And uh, Cornelia Hancock, another famous Civil War nurse who we talked about, uh, I, I spoke with um, Dr. Melissa DeValvis earlier. Um, several weeks ago, you can watch that video on YouTube, but we talked quite a bit about her. Uh, Jones, like many female nurses, inserted herself into the public sphere in a way previously unavailable to women. Their interactions with strange men away from home were seen as taboo at times, and why Dorothea Dix tried to hire, um, how she described, plain women um, to work for her to prevent anything scandalous from happening. After the war though, while most women returned to the domestic sphere, that shouldn't obscure how revolutionary their wartime experience was and how it impacted future generations of women. Female relief work uh, created a site of contested gender roles and identity where it hadn't really existed before. And the fight for pensions after the war was a fight over what that service meant. Uh, Claire Jones played a small part in that story and her spirit embodied the best of the movement. Perhaps no written word so encapsulates the indomitable spirit displayed by Clara Jones through her Civil War career as a song that she learned near the end of 1861. And this is quoting from a letter that she wrote to Lane. You know, I'm one of the strong minded females. None but weak minds are overcome by sorrow and misfortunes. Did you ever hear the song, I paddle my own canoe? I'm learning it. It just suits me. You know, I never leaned entirely on anybody, and I always felt a secret satisfaction in taking care of myself. It doesn't take much imagination to see Clara Jones embodied in the lyrics from the song's first verse. I've traveled about a bit in my time, and of troubles I've seen a few. I found it better in every climb to paddle my own canoe. My wants are small, I care not at all. If my debts are paid when due, I drive away life in the ocean of life while I paddle my own canoe. And you can easily imagine Clara Jones in her quieter moments at the Lyceum Hospital at Gettysburg or on one of her long train rides humming, I paddle my own canoe to herself while on the journey to her next mission of mercy. And that's all I have for you about uh, Clara Jones. Hope you enjoyed. I know I certainly enjoy talking about her and I'm uh, especially excited to chat with you all in the comments and uh, kind of go through some of these uh, these questions here. You get all that pulled up. But yes, uh, unquestionably a stunning and remarkable story. Okay, Let's see here, getting that pulled up. My computer, bless it, uh, has uh, seen better days in the past here. Okay. And uh, I'm sure Jake has been chipping in in the um, chipping in, in the comments. Okay, here we go. Um, let me see. Does did Lane's family donate the letters I see here? And I'm not sure if I'm going to get to these. I'm assuming these are in order. Uh, anyway, um, Sarah asked, did Lane's family donate the letters? Um, no, we don't. We actually don't have hardly any letters from Lane. Um, they're almost exclusively of Clara writing to Lane, and and the 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 letters were donated um, by one of John Dye's children descendants, um, like a, a great granddaughter or something something like that. Um, so if Lane wrote letters back to her, which uh, we know he did, I mean, I'm not sure if they survive or where they are. Um, I'd love to read them, um, but uh, 
we, we don't know much, if anything, about uh, Lane's family. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, good, Sharita. I'm glad that uh, Clara Jones is now officially in your top five favorite Civil War nurses. Um, got another question that was sent in advance to me. Um, and let me pull that up here. I want to read it. Uh, were there any, uh, any useful male nurses? Um, there had to be. Uh, so, you know, of course, women nurses get a lot of press for all kinds of very, very good reasons. Um, but there, there were indeed a number of, of men that acted in a nursing capacity, did some of the same jobs that, uh, that women nurses did. Um, a lot of them um, were hospital stewards, like that, that was sort of an official job title. Uh, sometimes recovering soldiers were kind of co-opted into the role of nurse. Um, uh, or those that had had a limb amputated rather than going back to their unit. Sometimes they would stay on in hospitals and work as nurses. Um, so they, they existed in that way, but oftentimes the word nurse wasn't applied to them. Um, they would be called either hospital stewards because that's kind of the, the rank that they enlisted as, uh, or they might be part of the Invalid Corps or Veteran Reserve Corps, as it was called. So um, there were plenty of men performing similar duties, um, but they were not as often um, called nurses. And there are not as many kind of famous examples, um, again, famous examples as there are of women. Um, and, and partly because in some, in a lot of cases, they, you know, it was a job they, they signed up to do. And a lot of, with women, it was kind of volunteer work. Um, and, you know, then, of course, you have the, the groundbreaking aspect of it and, and all that stuff. So that uh, speaks to that a little bit. Uh, Anne writes, did Clara document that she actually changed dressings? Um, I can't remember if she wrote specifically if, if she did that. I'm positive that she did. Um, she kind of uh, alludes to it uh, during her time at the Lyceum. Um, so I, I'm certain it did happen, but I can't remember if she wrote in any specific detail about that. Let's see. Um, yeah, Beverly, you're right. Even if the plague threatened, sounds like she would have been working in healthcare now. Um, I, I think that's very safe to assume. Um, let me see. Uh, glad Cynthia is enjoying these presentations from San Diego. Um, Yes, uh, Alexandria was actually under union control for the vast majority of the war. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, I don't know much. So Sharita talking about her top five nurses, um, one of her favorites. Um, and I hope I'm saying this right. Delity Powell, a 14-year-old Confederate nurse in Florida, followed her father in his artillery regiment very close to her hometown. Very cool. I don't know very much about her. Um, Sounds like a, a, another remarkable story. Um, right, let's see. Okay, uh, Clara's fellow nurses, um, occasionally, um, you know, people of other teachers from her school came. Um, the only one I think that she names by name is Miss Marie. Um, she uh, will often refer to people just by an initial like E, or M or something like that. So sometimes it, it I'm just not sure who it was. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, so Sharita, yeah, her, her letters are not available. My, my blog posts on the website are the, the closest thing to her letters being available. Um, they're in the collection at the museum. Um, you know, we're, we're keeping them, preserving them. Um, and when, when this is all over, I, I'm sure the museum will do something with them, uh, you know, eventually. Uh, our goal is to make as much of our collection publicly accessible online as we can. Um, but, you know, with us not, not getting into the, <laughs> the office for a while, hard to say when that'll be. But um, the long-term goal is to make these letters publicly accessible. Um, so stay tuned <laughs> on that. Um, let's see here. Uh, can I cite the news? Anne asks if I can cite the newspaper. Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, probably. Hold on. Um, 
Hold on, let me see if I can find this. Shoot, no. Uh, the answer is yes, but I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, stand by. Um, at the end of this, I'll like run downstairs real quick and, and try and find it. I know right where to find that citation. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, Lynn asked, did she participate in the Red Cross in any capacity? Um, at least during the Spanish-American War. Uh, as, of course, the Red Cross wasn't around um, during the Civil War. Um, it's founded uh, in the United States anyway, after the Civil War, um, by your friend and mine, Clara Barton. Um, and so they, Clara Jones engaged with them during the Spanish-American War, but it's hard to say if she did beyond that. My guess would be yes, um, but hard to say. Um, let's see. Yeah, tough, tough about her um, not, uh, not getting the pension. Um, as a volunteer, did she receive pay while she was performing nursing duties? Not at all. Um, she, her, and, and that's why she couldn't do it full time. She, if she received pay, I guarantee you she would have quit her job as a teacher and um, gone, gone to the front to the hospitals and, uh, and worked there full time. Um, so she, she was reliant on her teaching job to get the bills paid. So let's see, uh, another great program from the museum. Thank you, John and Jake. Thank you, Dean. Appreciate it. Um, let's see. Can you repeat the connection with the Second Corps Field Hospital, Anne asks. Um, I'm not exactly sure how Clara Jones found her way there on the Gettysburg battlefield. Um, uh, she, in her diary, um, because uh, in her diary, she just writes that that's where she was. Um, I'm not sure if she spoke with someone and was assigned there, like if, uh, you know, there was a medical director she kind of came into contact with and was like, you know, we could really use help at the Second Corps Field Hospital, but she just kind of wound up there. Um, I don't think there was any particular rhyme or reason. Um, Lane Schofield, for example, I think, um, I don't think Lane's unit was in the Second Corps. Um, it was either in uh, the, the First or maybe the Fifth Corps or something like that. I think the Fifth Corps. Um, so she wasn't, you know, by her friend that she knew. So I, I'm sure it was probably that's where the need was greatest or something like that. Uh, when traveling to battlefield sites, who did she travel with? Uh, often fellow teachers. It was usually just one or sometimes two. Um, but yeah, fellow teachers that she worked with at school or people from her hometown. The other like-minded individuals that, um, you know, wanted to help out and do some good, you know. Um, thank you, Gary, for asking that. Um, let me see here. Love your bow tie. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> tie day Friday. Um, Vicki, I'm glad we could uh, speak to nursing, which is one of your special interests. Excellent. Yes, truly an inspiration uh, indeed, Maureen. Um, a, lot of, a lot of lessons uh, to take this. Uh, Linda, John does work at the museum. I'm the education coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Been there for uh, three years coming up um, next weekend. And uh, um, part of why the subject of Claire Jones is so near and dear to my heart um, is uh, um, going through her letters was one of the very first things uh, I did at the museum. So, uh, so that was, it's always fun to get to revisit uh, the Claire Jones story. Um, ooh, good question from Maureen. Um, did any of the nurses have formal training? If not, I would assume it was learn as you go. Um, you're correct. Um, most of the nurses, if not all, um, really didn't have much in the way of formal training. Now they did have some kind of circumstantial training. So a lot of healthcare in the 19th century before the Civil War was in the home, it was done at home. And so uh, it was not uncommon for women of the house to be sort of the caretakers of the home. So if someone in, in the house, excuse me, in the household was sick, or injured, um, it would typically fall to them to care for them. Um, and so no doubt, uh, you know, women at the time of the Civil War had picked up all kinds of tips and tricks and, you know, all that. So they probably had some experience, um, but 
nothing, of course, that would prepare them for something like the Civil War. Um, and you know, the more you go and the more you encounter this stuff, of course, the better the better you get at it. It's sort of the uh, the ten thousand hour theory. And if you do something for ten thousand hours, you become a master. And certainly for Civil War surgeons. Um, they were truly masters of medical care by the end of the Civil War, um, basically. Um, and, and Clara Jones, no doubt, got better at, at that as, uh, as time went on. Um, doo -doo -doo. Ah, Sharita wrote about uh, Dalidi in a blog post on, on her own site. Uh, if someone is interested in learning more about her, I'll, I'll probably go and go and read that right after this as uh, me reading that probably wouldn't make for very exciting uh, uh, television, as it were. <laughs> uh, if we have more questions, may we send them to slash through your website, Linda asks. Uh, yes, yes, you can. You can, uh, you can email me directly. Uh, my email is john.lustria at civilwarmed.org. Um, civilwarmed.org is our website. And uh, Lustria is L-U-S-T-R-E-A. It's probably somewhere in the description of the video. Um, so you can, you can email me directly. And on our website, um, we have a, uh, a, a section where you can send in a specific research request. And that goes to, to our staff as well. Um, so if uh, you wake up in the middle of the night and the question came to you, uh, go ahead and submit a research request through the website. Um, and and we'll, we'll get back to you uh, on that. Uh, let's see. Ah, Sherwood uh, asks, unrelated, you guys ever look at medicine for Civil War animals, horses that is? Is there any record of this? Did vets exist or was it all laymen, uh, so to speak? Um, yes, um, I'll direct you to a couple different things. Um, they don't really get in, Brad doesn't get into this in the video, um, but if you're curious about animals in the Civil War on our Facebook page, um, Brad Stone, one of our volunteers, did a, just a great video about animals in the Civil War. Um, so you can check that out. And he's going to be giving kind of a larger talk where I'm certain he'll get into medical care of animals um, eventually, whenever we can reopen out at the Pry House um, in August of this year, tentatively. We'll see. Um, but that's, that's what we're shooting for. Um, so there's that. And then we also on our website have a blog post about veterinary medicine in the Civil War. And I don't think we the post gets quite as specific as maybe you're looking for Sherwood, but that, that will at least give you an idea. Um, so um, anyway, the, that, that's what I'd point you to for starters. Uh, oh, Lori, thank you so much. Uh, would be thrilled to have you, uh, have you be a member. Um, that would be that would be wonderful. It's a, a thrill to welcome everybody aboard. Um, and then Robert asks, is there a third Clara out there? Clara Barton, Clara Jones, Clara Blank? Uh, no doubt. I'm certain there is another one, but there's not one that comes to mind um, that I that I think of. Uh, and I also got sent a question in advance. Um, did Clara Jones have a, a, a religious background? Um, it's hard to say. She doesn't really talk very explicitly about religion in, in her letters. Um, my sense is that she was um, probably a, a practicing Christian. I mean, faith, I think, plays a little bit of a role in her life, but I don't think it was uh, a central part of her life in the way that it was for, for some others. Um, I, if I read it correctly, which I may not. She, again, she doesn't talk explicitly about it. I could be wrong. Um, but I think she was sort of religiously literate for the, the 19th century, which is certainly much more than, than nowadays, but I'm not sure to what extent that she practiced um, uh, anything. So that's uh, about Clara Jones. But uh, uh, again, Lori, thank you so much for uh, filling out a membership form. We'd love to have you aboard. Uh, and as we kind of come to a close here, thank you everyone for watching. Um, it was a thrill to, to be with you this day uh, on this Friday, um, celebrating National Nurses Week. Um, you know, again, never more thankful for them than, than nowadays. And of course, working at the museum, we're pretty much always thankful um, for them, but we're especially thankful now 
thankful for the good work that Clara Jones did, and thankful for you all um, for tuning in and watching these videos. Um, it's been fun um, chatting and interacting with all of you. Um, and thank you to Jake for manning the comments. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please give a like, give a share um, to the video, tell your friends, um, like our Facebook page, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're able, we would love if you could become a member. Uh, being a member of the museum helps us bring videos like this to you on a regular basis. And if you can't become a member, uh, a donation, or if you're already a member, another donation always helps us you know, during this time where we're essentially making very little money, you know, no admissions coming in. But if you're not at a place where you can do that, um, the best thing that you can do would be to share this video. And I know all of you can do that. Just click the share button right there. You do it. Do it right now. I'm watching you. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, thank you again for watching. It was really a pleasure to be uh, to be with all of you today. And I uh, hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your day. This is John signing off.